For more than three centuries, from the Forum Romanum to the trading posts of India, Roman emperors were worshipped as gods. Their statues appeared in household shrines. Their birthdays were celebrated by the legions. And in marble sanctuaries throughout the provinces, priests in gilded crowns offered sacrifice to the just and munificent god-emperors of Rome. Yet emperors, as plagues and assassins repeatedly demonstrated, were all too mortal. Nor, even by the loose standards of the Olympians, did they often exhibit godlike qualities. The emperors themselves were aware of their ambiguous divinity. As he lay dying, Vespasian, aware that his son Titus would deify him after his death, joked, Alas, I think I'm becoming a god. The Romans laughed, and then, when he died, they made Vespasian a god. The Roman imperial cult had distinguished antecedents. Alexander the Great had demanded that the Greek cities offer him divine honors. The Hellenistic kings followed his example and were revered as gods by cities in their domains. In the Ptolemaic court at Alexandria, there were priests for Alexander the Great, for the reigning king and queen, and for all their deified predecessors. There was no precedent for divine kingship in Rome, whose republican political tradition long prevented any individual from claiming absolute power. But in the final years of the Republic, as the traditional restrictions broke down, Julius Caesar appears to have taken tentative steps toward a Hellenistic-style royal cult, complete with an altar and priests. Although he was assassinated before these plans could come to fruition, his political allies, headed by Octavian, the future Augustus, compelled the Senate to recognize Caesar as a god. A temple of the deified Caesar was built beside the Forum, its pediment glittering with a bronze image of the comet said to have carried Caesar's soul to the heavens. Augustus presided over the creation of his own imperial cult. In Rome and the western provinces, where there was no tradition of deification, the princeps was carefully distinguished from the gods. Instead of being worshipped directly, he was revered in association with the goddess Roma or the Senate, or through the proxies of his lares and genius, his guardian spirits, or his numen, his divine power. But in the eastern provinces, where even the generals of the Roman Republic had been granted divine honors, Augustus was openly worshipped as a god. Upon his death, Augustus was formally deified by the Senate and granted a temple and a college of priests in Rome. In this, as in so much else, he set the pattern for the rest of the Principate. Although living emperors continued to be worshipped in the Greek East, they were recognized as gods in Rome and the western provinces after their deaths. Deification came to be seen as a seal of approval. Only emperors who had ruled well were worthy of inclusion among the gods. Augustus's immediate successors did not rule well. Tiberius antagonized the Senate too often to be apotheosized. Caligula proclaimed himself a living god, but once he was safely dead, the Senate denied him divinity. Claudius, the next emperor, returned to the Augustan model and was duly deified. The practice of posthumously deifying worthy emperors had been institutionalized by the beginning of the second century, when, in a speech praising Trajan, Pliny the Younger piously anticipated the time when the emperor would join the gods. It was still important, however, for emperors to avoid seeming eager for divine honors. In response to one of Pliny's letters, Trajan professed reluctance to associate even his statues with his deified predecessors. That the emperors, living and dead, were worshipped by millions of Romans is clear. Whether they were believed to be gods in the same sense as the Olympians is less apparent. We'll explore the elusive issue of belief after a brief word about this video's sponsor. Are you too busy to cook this fall, but want to be sure that you're eating well? With our partner, Factor, you can skip extra trips to the grocery store and the tedium of food prep while still getting all the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. I recently returned from a long research trip 
and can't seem to find any time for cooking. Fortunately, Factor makes it easy to eat both quickly and well. I especially enjoyed the garlic and herb-roasted mushrooms, which came with mashed potatoes and green beans. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code TOLDENSTONE50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that's 50% off by using TOLDENSTONE50 at factor75.com. Returning to our topic, some sources attribute miraculous powers to living emperors. Vespasian was said to have healed a blind man and a cripple in Alexandria. Hadrian was credited with ending a drought in Africa, and Marcus Aurelius reportedly called lightning down on barbarian siege engines. Similar or greater feats, however, were ascribed to traveling sages and magicians like Apollonius of Tiana. The emperors did not owe their divinity to supernatural abilities, but to the simple fact of their power over the lives of millions. Both the emperors and their subjects recognized the political functions of the imperial cult. Especially in parts of the western provinces, the emperors actively promoted the cult to encourage both adherence to Rome and cooperation among local elites. Local elites, for their part, saw the advantages of playing along, especially in the densely urbanized eastern provinces, where the imperial cult, with its temples, festivals, and priesthoods, provided ambitious men with a convenient arena for winning the approval of their fellow citizens. Although the rituals of the imperial cult were modeled on those of the traditional gods, emperors were seldom worshipped on precisely the same terms as the Olympians. In more or less subtle ways, ranging from the position of their statues to the prepositions used in prayer, they were set apart, honored with the same ceremonial as the other gods, but not regarded or revered in quite the same light. This does not mean, however, that the Romans didn't believe that their emperors were gods. In a sense, belief didn't matter. Unlike, say, Christianity or Islam, Roman religion was not founded on belief. That the gods existed was taken for granted. What mattered was addressing the gods properly. The Romans had a contractual view of religion, encapsulated by the phrase, do ut des, that is, I give so that you will give. The gods would bestow their blessings if, and only if, they received the proper sacrifices and prayers, regardless of what the men making those sacrifices and prayers believed. The imperial cult fit neatly into this conceptual framework. Deified emperors could be revered as another set of gods who had to be propitiated with the right rituals. Especially in the eastern provinces, with their long tradition of royal cult, the reigning emperor might be regarded in much the same light as the other gods. In this sense, the imperial cult became a way of understanding and appealing to the authority of Rome. Religious and political practice, in short, were never distinct. When Hadrian's young lover Antinous drowned in the Nile, the grieving emperor declared him a god. Cult statues and shrines soon appeared throughout the provinces, as local elites competed to catch the emperor's favor. But long after Hadrian was gone, Antinous, often associated with Osiris or another god, continued to be invoked in prayers, pictured on amulets, and honored with games. His cult survived until the rise of Christianity. The imperial cult was ultimately about addressing power, but then so was traditional Roman religion. If not a god himself, the emperor had much in common with the gods, especially for the millions of Romans without direct access to him. Though distant, he possessed great power to help or harm. He had only to be reached with the proper prayer. My new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines, is now available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can buy your copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. For more Told and Stone content, check out my channels, Told and Stone Footnotes, and Scenic Routes to the Past, which are linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told and Stone on Patreon. 
Thanks for watching.